I hope none of you will go away disappointed. I am not obviously in a position to answer all questions. And indeed, there may well be some questions that I do not know the answer. I always like to throw the meeting open because I find that often questions are asked which are very stimulating, not only to myself, but often to other members of the audience. Because we are discussing tonight a subject which, to say the least, is very controversial. Spiritualism is a very controversial subject. There are many aspects of which some can cause to some people, even those who have been in the movement many years, certain qualms or certain doubts. And I suppose we have to accept the obvious fact that communication between this world and the next is not cut and dry. It isn't as easy, perhaps, as we would perhaps like to think. Communication between our friends and ourselves, by its very nature, is complex. Whatever form of mediumship is used, somewhere along the line, there is the medium. And I think it's true to say that the better type of mediumship is that where the medium has little or nothing to do with the phenomenon. Most people are acquainted, I suppose, with what is usually termed mental mediumship. That is the type of mediumship where the medium receives inspiration or perhaps receives clairvoyance or perhaps has the ability to sense or feel or perhaps it may be in some other direction. There are many forms of mediumship. And over the last century, roughly, the most tested form of mediumship, and the kind of mediumship that probably, almost certainly, I think, convinced skeptics like Crooks and Lodge and Flammarion, was what is usually <coughs> referred to as physical mediumship. Now, it is assumed, I use the word assume, that physical mediumship, at its best, has little or nothing to do with the medium. By that I mean the medium is not in any way interfering or getting in the way of the demonstration or the mediumship that is being used. But we have to get back to the very beginning to realize that all communication, whatever form it may take between this world and the next, is a mental process. In other words, whoever wishes to convey a message to us from the other side of life has to transmit their thoughts through the instrumentality of a medium. With physical mediumship, it is much more likely that the conscious mind, or if you like, the subconscious mind of the medium is cut out of the communication. But I think it is only right and fair to say that it is much more unlikely, of course, that the medium will get in the way, if you like, of the communication. But it doesn't alter the fact that somewhere Along the line, in my mediumship, or any other <coughs> form of mediumship, the medium, unconsciously, can affect the phenomenon. And so, of course, can the sitters. When people go to a medium, mm -hmm. invariably, they have strong, firm, fixed ideas as to what they would like to receive from the outside. In other words, obviously, if you've lost your only son in a car crash and you've read a few books on this subject and you think to yourself, is it possible that the other side, the so-called dead, can communicate? When you go to a church or spiritual society or sit with a medium, your main purpose in going is in the hope that if it's true spiritualism, 
that you will be able to contact yourself. This, of course, is only human and understandable. But one has to bear in mind that all the time we are dealing with living thoughts. And we do not always know how much unconsciously <coughs> the medium or the sitter can affect the phenomena. And that is why the best evidence of survival is invariably that which the sitter or sitters or the inquirer, if you so wish to refer to the person as such, uh, receives information or messages from an individual and the context of the message that is given is completely foreign and unknown to the recipient. A lot of people, when they go to mediums, quite naturally and rightly, as I've already said, hope and pray that they will receive a message from those near and dear. And quite often they do, no one doubts that. But the point is that if we are sincerely, deeply involved in this subject, and we are inquiring in an intelligent and an analytical way, no matter how much we may receive from a known entity, someone that has been close and near and dear to us, there is always a lingering doubt in the minds of some people that possibly, in an unconscious way, they have contributed to the phenomena or they have contributed to the message. In other words, they wonder if it is some telepathic <coughs> something that the medium may have picked up and then given to them as a message from the so-called dead. You see, I've been in this movement half a century. I've been a medium for 40 odd years. I have listened to thousands of communications of all manner and of all kind. And I am as critical, perhaps even more so, now now, when I first started, when I was only 15, 16 years of age, because I realized, which even a lot of spiritualists don't realize, the enormous complexity of this subject. People sometimes make hasty judgments about mediums. They will go to a medium, perhaps a medium who has a good reputation, and has been much publicized in the psychic news or books have been written about the medium in question and people say, I, I could get a sitting with Enoch Twig or I could get a sitting with Leslie Twig I'm sure I could get my boy through or I'll get my mother through or what have you well that's very natural, very understandable in a sense but at the same time one should realize that you may not get the message or the communication that you want on the first attempt. Indeed, you might even go to a medium, and if the medium is an honest man or woman, they might say, I'm sorry, I don't see anything, I don't hear anything, I don't get anything. And of course, it's a bit of disappointment to the inquirer. But at least it's honest. You see, I feel that we are all in this together. We're perhaps, on a set, in a sense, on different structures or different levels and we're all seeking in our own individual way, and each individual has his, his or her own idea of what they will accept as evidence. And I have known of instances of people who, without any personal evidence whatsoever, are convinced of survival by hearing messages that other people have received, and perhaps after a church service or a session with a medium, they walk to the railway station or the tube or what have you and they have talked to the person and the person in question has said, oh, I've never met that man before, but what my son said only could have been said by my son, etc. And so sometimes some people have to accept or become, if you like, to some extent convinced of survival by listening to other people's evidence. There are so many aspects of the subject, there are so many complexities, and I would be the first person, last person to deny the obvious fact that this is a complex subject. Now we are talking, in my case anyway, about independent red boys. One might say to oneself, how independent is it? 
Now that would be a sensible and an intelligent question to ask, particularly if you've had a seance with me and you might perhaps have been unfortunate, had no personal evidence which might give you some satisfaction or some conviction, and you hear voices and perhaps you don't know the people in question who speak, or perhaps if someone does speak to you that claims to be a relation of yours, you may not necessarily recognize the voice as you remember it. There are many subjects. And this is also what makes the whole subject so fascinating. I don't think one moment that I could have done 40 odd years as a medium if I were not always aware of the possibility the next time I sit, something unusual will be said, or something extraordinary may well happen. And when you have listened, as I have listened to thousands of voices of all man and kind, of, of individuals, some famous, some just ordinary people coming back to speak to their relatives, and knowing full well that I couldn't possibly conceivably know anything about their personal relationships, <coughs> because I, in most instances, have never even met the people before, and it would be absolutely impossible for anyone to produce the kind of phenomena that I produce or have been able to produce in the past, it would be impossible for it to be other than what it is, communication from an outside source. Over the years, going back to when I was in my very early twenties, I have given myself willingly to scientific research. I'm not going to suggest for one moment that every seance that has been under test conditions has been successful, uh, but there have been many that have been very successful, because the very conditions which are created by individuals who approach it more often than not to disprove rather than to prove, does set up an atmosphere and a condition which is not necessarily always conducive to the best possible results. And of course, the medium, myself, uh, is apprehensive and tense and over-anxious. And all these factors have a part to play. Many years ago, in my early twenties, I used to sit for Dr. Louis Young. Dr. Louis Young had worked with Edison in America. And um, he also came over to England to work for masculine demand. And actually, he created a lot of the effects of masculine debate, the great illusionists who used to live in George's Hall in the early part of the century. And he became convinced of survival through, partially more or less through my leadership, and I was allowed, or he, I allowed him rather, to subject me to all manner of kinds of tests. Well, since then, I've done so many of these tests with the SPR, Society of Psychical Research, sometimes on their premises, sometimes in somebody else's house or flat, and in America too. And we have had results which people have had to admit couldn't have been brought into being any other way than the fact that they were from an outside source. But of course, all these tests will never convince the individual who was not present. And in fact, one might say the only test is the individual personal test of somebody who goes to a medium, whether it's me or some other medium, and they know full well that the person in question, the medium, could know absolutely nothing about them, or their background, or their personal affairs, and they receive staggering, as indeed in some instances people do, evidence to substantiate the claim that we are in touch with the so-called dead. One go into this subject in such diverse ways that one can spend hours and hours and hours discussing. I mean, all religions are founded on the life after death. There might be one or two exceptions to that, but most religions are founded on the premise that there is a life to come. If there's no life after death, there's no point in religion. Whether it's Christianity or whatever it is, the prophets, the teachers, the great sinners of the past all had the gift of the Spirit. They could see and they could hear and they did what we would now term, or some people would term, miracles. And even Christ himself said, the greater things than these shall you do, for I'm applying down to my power. In other words, Christ, who was probably the greatest instrument, or if you like, 
medium, achieve things which even today have never been uh, uh, done, never been copied or imitated. What I want to get at more than anything to people is the reality of these things. But I also would like to point out not the dangers as such, but at the same time how necessary it is to be intelligent and kindly critical and analytical of mediums, and that includes me. No medium is infallible. Mediums unconsciously sometimes will misrepresent what is being given to them from an outside source, the other side. We all know that one word in a sentence or the emphasis in the wrong place can alter the whole meaning of what was intended. And so when we get contact, we have to be kindly, critical, and analytical. We have to say to ourselves, now, how much of that that I received could have been known to the medium? How much of that which came through was known to me? And if it was known to me, did telepathy come into this? Did the medium unconsciously pick up things from my thoughts? But that is why coming back again to this one point, the best evidence is that which the sitter often says, no, I don't understand it, it doesn't make sense. I have had innumerable occasions when after a silence, and it's been taken for it, a person has said, well, Mr. Clinton, I have no clue who that person was, or what they were, they were trying to convey to me means absolutely nothing. I could go to death on this. And perhaps weeks later, they telephone, or perhaps they've written, or perhaps they've had a, an appointment to come again and sit with me. And I, I could get to death on this, and as much as the people have said, Mom, Mr. Fenn, this is extraordinary. I played that tape recording over to a distant relation of mine who I haven't seen for years. And that person knew that person very well, and everything that that person said was 100% correct. Actually, it did happen, as they said, at the seance. That is evidence, because it cannot be picked out of your mind, because you didn't even know you were back here. It couldn't have been in the mind of the medium. So what we have to bear in mind is that when we sit with a medium, whatever comes through, and message is absolutely stupid, and I've been the first to admit that a lot of things do come through mediums that are so stupid that one's own intelligence tells you that it couldn't possibly have come from the other side of life, unless, of course, they got much worse over there than they were here. <laughs> <laughs> and seriously, and, and I really mean this, I feel very, very intensely about this whole subject. More intense now, possibly, because I won't say I'm on the way out, uh, but when I was on the way in, uh, I was enthusiastic and, and I developed my medium shirt and we had some extraordinary happenings. I could go into depth on that in a bit far too long. Uh, but now I'm much more hyper than I've ever been. And although it's not for me to pass comment on other people and their work, because I sincerely believe that all mediums are sincere. I think that they're all trying to do the best they can, and they're all anxious to help other people, and particularly to comfort those who mourn, and those who need help in illness, whether it's mental or physical. But one has to come back to the reality that there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of stupidity, there's a lot of nonsense. And a lot of these people, with all due respect, they are not devoted mediums. They want to help. They do try to help. But they often do unconsciously much more harm than they do good. And I think that spiritualism loses a lot of highly intelligent, analytically minded 
people who are sincerely searching and seeking truth. And they listen sometimes to a lot of this, well, I was going to use the word rubbish. And they say, well, if that's spiritualism, you can keep it. And unfortunately, this happens in many, many societies and many, many churches. You can't blame the churches, you can't blame the committee of the church, because until they listen to a medium, uh, they're not in a position to form an opinion whether that medium is worth cooking again. And then again, we come back to square one. A medium may one day, if on an occasion, be appalling. And yet that same medium, the next night, perhaps in another church or another society, may be absolutely wonderful. And of course, getting back a rather away from the voice phenomenon, which is what I really, I suppose, come to talk about. But with mental mediumship, it's much more difficult for a mental medium to be on the beam. What I mean by that is that by its very nature, mental mediumship is really something that the medium receives mentally, mostly by impression. When a medium says, I see with a lady sitting at the back, that's right, dear, you with a red hat and a feather. I see with you so and so and so and so. Now, what we have to ask ourselves here is, when the medium says, I see with you, is she seeing with her eyes? Or is she getting a strong mental picture or impression? And until she has delivered the message and the recipient or the sitter says, oh yes, friend, I understand that, or I do not understand, the medium hasn't a clue whether what they are seeing, so-called, is true or not. And this applies, really, in a sense, it applies to all mediumship. And we have to be honest about this. I think a lot more honesty in spiritualism is what we desperately need. There are mediums who do, at times, see visually with their eyes. But with most mental mediumship, it is sensing and feeling and seeing in a mental way of picturization in the mind and it can be a hundred percent correct. Nobody denies this. But with physical mediumship, the kind of mediumship that convinced the great scientific minds was physical. Physical from the point of view that it could be, in some instances, photographed by infrared uh, with materialization. Not only did one person see, but everyone in the room saw the formation of the entity and its disappearance. And although the room had been searched and the medium was under test conditions, this was something solid. This was something material. It wasn't something that was wishy-washy. It wasn't something that might be or it could be. It wasn't something that was conjured up by by a thought process. It was a physical thing. So with the direct voice, we come to what is termed a physical thing. When you hear a voice, not necessarily always recognizable, you must get this clear too, and it is recorded onto a tape in the presence of perhaps a dozen people. And as many years ago, when I did at Kingsway Hall and the Star of their own most of the principal town halls throughout the country, when I was boxed up in a cabinet, could barely breathe, and the microphones were always outside the cabinet, and the tannoy people who put the equipment in were so amazed, because they'd experimented, and they could never get anything from the cabinet through their microphones into the loudspeakers. And they even published a, a statement to that effect. When you can get a voice, and it is recorded, and it is sometimes, not always, recognizable as the voice of the deceased person whom the medium could never have met in life and couldn't possibly conceivably have known. And the context of the message is something so relevant and so personal and sometimes so evidential. Then we are talking about mediumship, the real thing. We're talking about mediumship that brings conviction, uh, that is in 
such a way that to doubt it, well, you'd have to be a very strange person indeed. Although there again, I'm sympathetic to the doubters. I'm very sympathetic to the people who cannot accept. I've had people who sat with me who, no doubt, I don't say they say it, but they no doubt think that none of the biggest faith had ever walked on two feet. I mean, I have had people who uh, I've heard, uh, heard or from people who said, oh, well, you know, I spoke to Mr. Jones, uh, he had a city with you nine months ago, and he thinks you're on the harmless thing to work with. And for many years ago, <laughs> many years ago, I gave a city for Gertrude's visit, they could be, uh, she was probably the old members of the audience will know what a wonderful woman she was, a tremendous personality. Anyway, I don't want to go into depth on this, but I remember after the very first time she sat with me, just after doing the walk, just after her son had gone down on the hood, her early son, and uh, her son spoke just for a brief area sentence, because it was his first attempt and it was very emotional. And apart from that, I remember his mother came through and was very concerned about Iva and wanted us to convey a message to Iva. But um, afterwards, the first thing she said, and she said to him, would be really such a character. Well, she said, Mr. Player, she said, I don't know, we weren't be like this before, but she said, all I can say is that if you're a bank clerk, you're the cleverest one I've ever met, and you make a fortune in the theater. <laughs> and uh, I've often wondered since, you know, well, it would have been rather nice in a way, but I don't think that I'd be very successful, because, to be quite frank about this, this is being honest. Uh, for every three sittings that I have, invariably I get one sitting, at least, where nothing happens at all. I had a sitting this morning. I don't sit very much nowadays, or at least I try to cut down. And you could have had a nicer bunch of sitters wherever you went. Uh, they were all very experienced, uh, well, at least most of them were experienced, and very sweet people. And the doctor and his wife and two of the friends that came one an opera singer and the other an actor, had sat with me before and had marvellous results. And we sat there for a solid hour, you know, because I don't go to any trances. I just talk to people and we had a lot of conversation, you know. And we sat and we sat and we sat and nothing, <coughs> absolutely nothing at all. Now this is mediumship. The mediums who produce rabbits out of hats twice nightly, like the Palladium Entertainer, are no damn good for anybody. Because I know as a medium, it's just not possible. These mediums who, <coughs> who got it out, you know, like this. Well, I think that shouldn't be so stringent. But they're not mediums, because mediumship by its very nature is not something that you can turn on like a tap with a million. Mediumship by its very nature is spontaneous. And what a lot of mediums try to do is they try to harness it and they give performance. You can read brochures, I don't wish to be offensive, but you can read, read brochures of the SAGB and places like that, and you turn the pages, and you see three months' time, at seven o'clock, Mrs. Twitty is going into France, <laughs> and her guide is going to give you a lecture on such a subject. This is three months ahead, and she might be on the other side as well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I gave an interview to the Sunday Mirror recently. I wasn't mad keen to do it, but they were very anxious, so I said, all right, I'll give you half an hour, come and have a chat. And a highly intelligent girl, she really was, a very nice, sweet, intelligent girl who was genuinely interested in the subject, but though she was very good at the Mirror. <laughs> and she spent three hours with me and one of the first things she said, oh, Mr. Flint, she said, you know, I'm, we're doing a series of articles in America, and I knew all this. She said, I've been up to that place in both as well. And she said, um, I got hold of that brochure, and I just told you the page, she said, now, I don't understand it. She said, I see a medium in about two months' time, at seven o'clock, she's going to give a chance to us. If she's genuine, how do they know that she's going to the trance at 7 o'clock? 
and that that night is going to be there and give an address on a certain subject. I said, your guess is as good as mine, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know when I give a sitting, and believe me, this is God's truth. I haven't a clue whether I'm going to have a successful sitting, or whether Mickey, or my guides, or whoever it is, is going to be there. I know that they will do their best to be there, and I know that if they possibly can, they will come through, and they will communicate, and they will do everything in their power. But there's no guarantee about mediumship. There's no guarantee whatsoever. And if you sit with mediums and you get failure, you should be jolly glad that you had failure. At least you now know that that medium's genuine. It's when they troop it out with unfailing regularity, that's when you want to start thinking deeply and get a little bit worried about it. <coughs> anyway, get back to the direct voice. I won't go into all the other aspects which are numerous. Actually, when we get down to the basic truth, very few people, if any, have any real knowledge of what I like to term the mechanics of mediumship. Oh, I know there are mediums who give series of lectures on how to become a medium and how to develop and all that. Well, frankly, I wouldn't be able to give one lecture on how a person should develop mediumship. This whole subject is too complex. And the only people who can develop or train a medium are not people on this side, but people on the other side, who know you and I better than we know ourselves. They know our complexities of our nature, they know the, prom the problems within our innermost selves, they know our weaknesses, and they also know our capabilities and our, the possibilities that lie dormant, latent within us, and the spiritual and the psychic force which is there, which can be brought out and utilized, developed, so that I suppose really one might say every human being in embryo is a medium, everyone can be in it. Because we are spiritual beings while yet in case of flesh. And since we develop during the course of our material lives and material capabilities and the possibilities that are dormant and latent within us, so we can develop the spiritual faculties and the psychic powers which are not latent to dormant. But the only people who can help us to develop those are the people on the other side who will work with us and guide us and help us to develop in every possible conceivable way if we cooperate intelligently with them. I'm not saying that there are not mediums on this side who are not in a position to be able to guide people's footsteps in the initial early stages of inquiry. I think that is absolutely true. I think that in the beginning it is helpful to get advice and guidance from a medium who has knowledge and experience. But it doesn't necessarily mean to say that every medium is capable of even that that particular medium in some instances is even a desirable person to help a person or persons to develop. There are some mediums, unfortunately, who do more harm than good in the trying to develop others. I am firmly, because I was brought up in the cradle of spiritualism, what I term the home circle. I came into spiritualism <coughs> when the old timers, and believe me, they were marvelous people, the old timers were then getting on a bit in years and they'd already done many years of service. I'm talking about the time when to be a medium, well, people really did look down upon you, and it was not an unknown thing to have stones thrown through your window or to be insulted publicly. They, these pioneers, they were dedicated people, and they had worked for many years, and they did so much, and many of them died in that day poverty, and they were dedicated to what they had to do with the cooperation of the spirit. They gave themselves completely, and they developed in the home. That is the place to develop mediumship, in the privacy of your own home, with people around you that you know and love and respect, who will work with you in loving cooperation. 
where no one has any axe to grind, no one wants to be a little bit better than somebody else, and you sit patiently week in and week out, month in and month out, and possibly year in and year out. And if you sit in that attitude of mind and you work together in love and in harmony, that is the cradle of first class leadership. There is no other way. I have had the privilege of sitting with some wonderful, wonderful leaders. I wish I could say there were leaders like it today. There may be half a dozen, I don't know. But there again, I would even go as far as to say that the best meetings are the ones you never hear anything about. They're not necessarily the ones who are publicized as psychic news. I'm not saying they're not good mediums, I just understand it. But some of the best mediums are the people <coughs> who don't want notoriety, they don't want publicity, in the privacy of the comfort of their own home, with their own friends, over many years they have developed, possibly in some cases, wonderful phenomena. And perhaps it's wrong in a sense that they keep it for themselves, because in a way that is not the right thing to do. Because if we are blessed with a wonderful mediumship, which could come for thousands of people, then we should, of course, open up our doors to others. But you see, the subtleties of mediumship are such that once you open your door to any Tom, Dick, or Harry, who may be interested, or who may not be interested in the right sense, he may be a sensation seeker. He may be somebody who says, oh, well, that's interesting. But I wonder how they do it. And the attitude of mind can ruin that circle, can ruin the mediumship. I have known of mediums who develop remarkable powers, and it's only taken one person to spoil that medium's powers and to destroy what could have been a great mediumship that would have come to thousands of people. I could go into depth on so many aspects of this subject, but I have to stick to more or less, I suppose, my own phenomenon. I don't claim to be infallible. No medium can be infallible. No medium should be infallible. But when the conditions are right, quite often we have the most fantastic communication. I have listened to thousands of conversations between the typical dead and the living. Some of the conversations have been so staggering that even at the time when I've been hearing what's been going on, I thought to myself, inside myself, which I shouldn't do, but I don't think that makes sense. Well, that's wrong. I think that's a problem. This is what I'm thinking. But it's correct. I've listened to conversations which are so personal and so intense and sometimes so emotional that when eventually the sitting is finished, everybody's just sitting there and tears are streaming down their cheeks. <coughs> because <coughs> when a mother is reunited to her son, perhaps the only son she had, this is the most wonderful thing. But there again, as wonderful as it is, it shouldn't stop there. Because I believe that we are given this privilege of the door being opened a little between this world and the next so that we get a glimpse of what lies ahead. But the point is that we must not be content just to sit still and to be comforted. In a sense, we should realize that this opening of the door is to a wider knowledge and a wider experience. And that if our son can come or our husband can come, then so can ourselves, who perhaps are much more highly progressed on a much higher spiritual level of consciousness. <coughs> I believe there is nothing impossible for the other side. But we have got to raise ourselves up a bit more than we do. I think so many spiritualists stay on one level. <coughs> they go every Sunday night to the local church it could be here. Or I call them the old faithful. They usually come up to the front. And when the medium gets stuck, as they often do, and 
a message that you is not reciprocated, is not accepted. One of the little old ladies or the little group space. I think that's the media. <laughs> and they're down there, it's got nothing to do with that. But they think that they're trying to meet as a message. Yeah. I mean, this is all very human. Perhaps I'm being a bit neatly. But the point is that we are in this together. And this is a deep and highly involved subject. What is evidence to one person is not evidence to another. And everyone will have his or her standards. But we have got to raise mediumship on a high level. And we've got to raise ourselves too. And we're not, <coughs> we should not be content with it now. We should not be content with the ordinary routine sort of message. I see with you as an old lady, she brings you a bunch of bars. I think it's your mother. Oh no, dear, that's not my mother. My mother's 95, she's still with me. I mean, that sort of thing that goes on. I mean, I've been facetious. But we have got to be analytical, kindly critical. I don't care two hoots. I never have, really. But certainly not of late. I don't care two hoots. Who does it me? All I can do is do my job. I may not always be in a position to do it successfully. I have sittings, as I've said, where nothing happens. And I feel desperately sorry for people. And because people do come long, long distances from abroad or wherever, and they've got to build up to it, they've waited months, fares are expensive, hotels are expensive, and they come and they all keep up and perhaps we sit and nothing happens like this. Terrible! But I can't manufacture it, I can't conjure it up. And personally, as disappointed as I may well be, and they are too, that is the way I want it to be. That's the only word. Unless we have honesty and integrity and sincerity and dedication and spiritualism, we might as well forget all about it. And a lot of harm is being done by half-baked mediums with intention, sincere, but stupid. Stupid to themselves, stupid to the movement. And we have got to get on the right path. And it's the only way. Anyway, I promised that I would um, put on a few recordings. In other words, what you will hear. Now, please understand that I do not suggest that these recordings of these four voices, taken at one of my <coughs> different sounds in a different time, but these are experts, that they will convince you. In fact, I'd be annoyed if they convinced you. Because anyone who's convinced by listening to a voice on the tape really will be convinced of anything. It's only personal experience will bring conviction. But I ask you to listen to these four voices. They are all dissimilar voices, a different personalities, different temperaments, different attitudes. And I think you'll find them interesting. And the first one that you'll echo the five. The first one is my little guy, Mickey, who was a newspaper boy many years ago in Camden Town. He died when he was about 11 years of age in an accident. He's a very amusing character, and he worked very, very hard. Then you'll hear the voice that is claimed to be Ellen Terry, the great actress. And I might mention in regard to Ellen Terry, as some of you may not know, but Ellen Terry was one of the greatest of our actresses. Uh, in this country. She played with Henry Irving at the Lyceum set, but he was also the first actor to be knighted. Anyway, I, I point out here uh, that many years ago, before the war, without my knowledge, I mean, I had no idea who was being brought to me, uh, but the Reverend Carl Sharp of Hampstead, St. Stephen's Church of Hampstead, who was deeply interested in spiritualism, and he used to sit with me from time to time, and often would ring me up and say, Leslie, I've got some very dear friends who I think you might be able to help, and I'd bring them along, and I used to say, yeah, of course, yes. Anyway, to have a long story here. On this occasion, he brought three people with him. I wasn't he would never introduce me to anybody. He said, Leslie, after the sitting is over, I will tell you I'll introduce you. Anyway, we had this marvelous sitting, and Ellen Terry came and spoke to these three people. And it turned out that the elderly lady was 
Ellen Terry's sister-in-law by marriage to her brother, Fred Terry, who was on the other side. Mm. And there was the daughter and also the granddaughter, and they were all members of the Terry family. That was my first introduction to Ellen Terry's relations, and they used to often sit Julia Nielsen Terry. She was a great actress in her day, and Fred Terry, that's Ellen Terry's brother, who was a regular communicator, whose voice you'll hear in London, uh, she used to come and bring Fred and her brother to talk to his wife, Julia Nielsen Terry, and the other two were members of the family. Uh, so I mentioned all that, because it's interesting. And Ted Butler, who was killed in a road accident, he's something of a character. He's quite an amusing character. He tells what happened to him when he was killed in an accident. And then there's a very charming little Scotch lass who comes and talks about her family and her arrival on the other side. And then the last one is um, Archbishop Lang, Cosmo Lang. Just an extract from uh, something that he had to say uh, many years ago at one of my sittings. So, if you like to listen to those, it'll take about 10 minutes, I suppose. And then after that, if anyone wants to ask me any questions, and I don't mind how personal they are, as long as they're honest, and they're all in this together, as I said, and we're all here to help each other if we can. If I can help anyone, 